Okay, let's get started. By my watch, it's 2 p.m. in Singapore on Friday, September 24, 2021. On behalf of the Singh Health Duke Global Health, uh, Duke and US Global Health Institute, I'm delighted to welcome all of you. I'm Amina Memu, Deputy Director of the Institute. The talk today is part of our monthly global health seminar series. In these sessions, we draw from our own faculty as well as guest speakers to present topics of global importance and engage with our community in Singapore and beyond to uh, address some of the pressure, pressing issues of our time. Today, we talk to Dr. Renzo Guinto, who will discuss the role of Asia in safeguarding the health of people and the planet. He will introduce the concept of planetary health, a new scientific field and ethical paradigm that integrates the health of both people and the planet. He will examine emerging planetary health threats and opportunities, especially in the Asian context. He will explore the role of Asia as a thought leader, solutions hub, and arena for inquiry and action to safeguard the health of the human civilization, the Earth's life support systems, and its living inhabitants for decades and even centuries to come. To give a brief introduction, Dr. Gwento is an associate professor of the practice of global public health and the inaugural director of the Planetary and Global Health Program of the St. Luke's Medical Center, College of Medicine in the Philippines. He was an Obama Foundation Asia Pacific leader and Aspen Institute New Voices Fellow. He is also a member of several high international groups, including the Lancet Chatham House Commission on Improving Population Health post COVID 19, the Lancet One Health Commission, the Advisory Council of Global Health 5050, and the Editorial Advisory Board of the Lancet Planetary Health. He has served as a consultant for various organizations, including the World Health Organization, the World Bank, USAID, International Organization for Migration, Healthcare Without Harm, and the Philippines Department of Health. Dr. Guinto obtained his Doctor of Public Health from Harvard University and the Doctor of Medicine from the University of the Philippines in Manila. In 2020, he was included by Tatler magazine in his Gen T list of 400 leaders of tomorrow who are shaping Asia's future. I certainly see him in that role, and, and we are delighted to have opportunities to work with him on several collaborative fronts. So, Renzo, thank you very much for joining us today. And before I hand over a few housekeeping notes, please keep, keep yourselves on mute the whole time. The, web, the webinar is being recorded, and you can post your questions in the chat box at any time, and they'll be addressed at the end. So, again, Renzo, thank you, and over to you. Thank you so much, Amina, for that very generous introduction. And, of course, to the uh, SDGHI, uh, which is which has been a very good partner uh, for the past several months, and and I really am very thrilled to be part of this this event. I'll just uh, make sure that you are already seeing my screen. Let me know. Are my slides up? Okay. Yes. So yes, thank you, Amina. And and so for the next several minutes, uh, I will be. Well, you gave me a very difficult task of one, introducing the concept of planetary health, uh, two, uh, exploring some of the major planetary health challenges that we are confronting today, especially in the Asian context. And third, uh, but la and lastly, uh, to explore what might be the role of, of our region, of our different institutions here in the Asia uh, region in safeguarding the health of people and planet. As you can see, there are several logos there uh, and I will elaborate on them later on as, as I proceed uh, in my talk. So first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that we now live in the uh, era or epoch uh, called the Anthropocene. Um, you might be familiar with the different geological uh, epochs in our um, you know, geologic time scale. Uh, and scientists are now agreeing that we now live in Anthropocene, which says that um, right now, the most uh, important and the biggest force that is shaping the face of the earth, that is uh, creating all these, uh, you know, huge, you know, transformations in the environment and in society uh, is, is humanity. You know, we're the biggest force. And that's why, as you can see here, anthropogenic change, we are seeing a lot of anthropogenic changes all around us, as you can see, and I will not belabor you with the details of this diagram from our consumption patterns to demographic shifts like migration, urbanization, aging, but also the still continuously growing uh, population of, of our planet, um, technological advancement. All of these are the anthropogenic changes that are 
modifying, altering our ecosystems, creating all these problems that you're seeing uh, uh, in the middle of this diagram, and um, in turn, uh, affecting the health of the human civilization. And later on, I'll also be talking about some of these health impacts. And so we cannot anymore deny that the environment is, is really critical, uh, both to the creation of disease and the exacerbation of health inequalities, but also you know, um, in the improvement of the, po of the population's health. Uh, again, if we uh, get our acts together and address these anthropogenic changes. And there are some frameworks that are quite uh, central uh, to uh, you know, this recognition of you know, the Anthropocene, the anthropogenic changes that impact our health and well being. The first framework is what you call the planetary boundaries framework. I wonder if uh, you know, anyone uh, in the audience is actually familiar with this framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And basically, this framework is saying that there are nine uh, boundaries that have already been identified. And unfortunately, as you can see here, two out of the nine boundaries have already been violated. They're in red. One is biosphere integrity, because over the past century, we've seen the fastest rate of extinction of creatures, great and small. And we know that biodiversity is integral to the long-term survival uh, of the planet and also uh, of humanity, because we get a lot of food and, and um, medicines, natural medicines, and all other uh, natural assets from biodiversity. And then the second um, planetary boundary that has already been violated is, as you can see there, biogeochemical flows of P and N, two important elements in the periodic table, phosphorus and nitrogen. And these, uh, the flows of these elements have already been hugely disturbed because of our addiction to artificial fertilizers that contain P and N uh, for agricultural use. And so two out of nine already violated and two out of nine are soon to be violated if we again uh, delay, for instance, climate action. So climate change is the one of the two in yellow. And we know that we've been given by uh, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, some uh, limits. You know, we can't go beyond uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, maximum 2 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase. Otherwise, the world will be way less uh, inhabitable. Uh, not just for humanity, but also for other living things. And then you, the other uh, you know, planetary boundary that is uh, soon to be violated is land system change. You know, we've been destroying our forests, turning uh, significant amounts of natural ecosystems into human habitation, uh, you know, turning them into cities, golf courses, uh, factories, so on and so forth. And so we need to um, you know, start thinking about how can we make sure we don't violate these two boundaries while at the same time reversing the destruction that we've already uh, created uh, onto uh, biosphere integrity and the biogeochemical flows of these two important elements. But it's not just about ensuring that we don't violate the boundaries. We have to make sure that while we are pursuing uh, the preservation of you know, the ecological ceiling of planetary integrity, we are also able to meet the daily needs of humanity. What is being described here as a, so as a social foundation, water, food, health, education, uh, housing, gender equality, a lot of them actually embedded in the sustainable development goals. And so as a response to this um, you know, tension, this, this dilemma, of safeguarding the planet while we try to safeguard uh, ourselves, uh, our own health and well being. Uh, Kate Rayworth, who is an Oxford uh, female economist, I have to recognize that uh, the most uh, progressive economists of our time are actually women. And Kate Rayworth came up with this concept of the donut economy, an economy that does not go beyond or overshoot. Uh, the ecological ceiling, the planetary boundaries, while at the same time meeting the social foundation, not having shortfalls in this basic uh, needs of humanity. And she called the donut economy as the safe and just space for humanity. 
So I think that this is really the type of economy that we need in order to achieve better planetary health. And I always say that the Donut Economics book should be a must read for every planetary health citizen in this day and age. So if you haven't uh, saw, uh, read the book, seen the book, I encourage you to grab a copy. And we're talk, we, you know, in this talk, I'm supposed to talk about the relevance of all these ideas uh, you know, in the Asian context. And there's actually a study by the University of Leeds. They tried to investigate among the countries in the world, which one is closest to becoming like a donut economy, which, which country is closest to becoming a donut. And you can already anticipate some of the answers. As you can see, the United States um, has, uh, you know, perhaps met almost every uh, important uh, social foundation, as you can see, very little red uh, inside uh, the donut. But as you can see also, there's a lot of red outside. And that just demonstrates that the United States and also a lot of uh, the high income countries have violated already their planetary boundary budget. And unfortunately, um, I know I'm addressing uh, perhaps a very uh, you know, largely Singaporean, Singaporean audience, and you have actually a very similar donut economy diagram as the United States and other highly industrialized countries in the Western world. So as you can see, you know, almost perfect in terms of achieving the social foundation, but at the same time, um, have uh, the country has violated almost every planetary boundary as well, very similar to that of the United States. My home country, on the uh, the Philippines, on the other hand, has actually not violated any physic biophysical planetary boundary, as you can see. There's there are no reds in the outer uh, circle of the donut. But as you can see inside, there's a lot of reds, um, you know, in the inner part of the donut. And that just shows to you that we still have a long way to go in terms of achieving good health for all, uh, high levels of literacy, um, and, uh, employment and, uh, um, you know, and, and water and housing and all these other important uh, determinants of health and well-being. And this is interesting because of all the countries in the world, this study deemed, um, you know, this uh, Vietnam as the country that is closest to becoming a donut, um, a country that is both, I think, three hours away by flight from either the Philippines or Singapore. And so we are really looking for, you know, countries that we can emulate, that we should emulate. Uh, we don't need to go far. And, and, you know, Vietnam is setting an example, a very good example of how to become a donut economy. Um, it has actually um, violated only one planetary boundary at a very minimal rate or a very minimal degree. And as you can see, it has also almost, not perfect, but almost achieved uh, the social foundations of humanity. So this is a very interesting study, of course, there's, there's more story behind the numbers, but this is just giving us a snapshot of what is the situation globally, including among several of the countries in the Southeast Asian region. How are our countries contributing to the planetary crisis, but also what are the gaps and challenges when it comes to achieving good uh, health and well being for our own citizens? And so that is why a planetary health approach, a planetary health paradigm is what we need in this day and age. Uh, I'm sure all of us, many of us in the room or in the Zoom rather, who come from the field of public health, we know what public health is. It's about advancing the health of human populations. But unfortunately, public health over the past century has achieved uh, great um, you know, accomplishments, progress in terms of nutrition, in terms of healthcare access, in terms of uh, fighting infectious and non-communicable diseases, but oftentimes at the expense of the planet. We've been putting food on the table, uh, improved global nutrition for many people around the world, 
but at the expense of the planet because as you've seen a while ago our use of fertilizers in large-scale agriculture has actually destroyed a one planetary boundary we've created new forms of pollution in the pursuit of improving health and human well-being and so as a physician i always say we cannot anymore just focus on people we now have two patients people and the planet on which the health of human civilization depends and this is how i actually visualize it in my mind there are now two patients the human patient wearing their mask to protect themselves from uh, the unseen coronavirus and the planetary patient mother earth wearing also her mask but not against the virus per se but against the myriad anthropogenic changes that i just described to you a while ago so planetary health the convergence of human health and the planet's health and you might be wondering what is the relationship between planetary health and all these other existing concepts and paradigms and frameworks global health geo health climate and health eco health one health uh, and all the other disciplines the earth sciences etc the way we simply you know this, this, describe uh, planetary health is it's truly a the grand convergence of all these frameworks disciplines paradigms as illustrated in this diagram and i'm pretty sure there are other disciplines and frameworks and paradigms that are not represented in this diagram we need to put more social science sciences into um into this diagram because the social sciences are the key to a fuller understanding of uh why as humanity we are actually uh, destroying the planet while at the same time improving our own health and well-being which is quite an irony and so this is an invitation all of us have a, an important role to play uh for the advancement uh, of planetary health and i just want to quote one of the great climate and health pioneers uh anthony mcmichael uh, an epidemiologist who was one of the first to elucidate the linkages between climate change and human health. He once said in the early 1990s that the health sector must lift its gaze to bigger ecological horizons. This will require a radical extension of the public health agenda. And I always say perhaps that radical extension that he, that he was talking about decades ago is now what we call planetary health. New forms of professional training not just in environmental health, but in all fields, a preparedness to base policy advice upon predictions and best guesses as opposed to empirical data. So we need to start acknowledging uncertainty and surprises, the climate crisis, this current pandemic, uh, all of these problems and challenges have made us realize that we need to be adaptive, we need to be open to uncertainty uh, because not everything can be subjected uh, under a cl randomized clinical trial and an ability to collaborate with unfamiliar disciplines like climatology and ecology and i always encourage my you know students my mentees that you should have friends from other disciplines if you're a physician or you are a public health professional you have to make sure you have friends from eco ecology from economics from the social sciences if we are to really mount collaborative transdisciplinary responses to these planetary health problems. So for the next couple of slides, I'll just do a quick survey of some of these major planetary health challenges. And of course, one of these uh, grand challenges of our time, of our generation, is climate change and its myriad health effects. And I will not go into the details of this diagram. As you can see, there are multiple boxes, multiple arrows, which basically tells us there are multiple pathways that link climate change with human health. And as you can see on your right, there is no single disease group that is immune to the effects of climate change, whether they are the infectious diseases, vector-borne diseases, even future pandemics, cardiovascular diseases, heat stroke, um when you get exposed to extreme heat uh under nutrition you know there is an estimate um or it was projected that there will be a 50 years worth of nutritional gains that will be reversed 
if climate action will be further delayed. And there is also a growing evidence on the linkages or the impacts of climate change on mental health outcomes, both in terms of the abrupt uh, climate-related disasters, as well as the more slow onset effects of climate change on you know, anxiety. There's a new term called eco-anxiety, climate grief. So this is a new arena in climate and health research. And of course, we know that our region, especially Southeast Asia, is, is very vulnerable. It is a climate change hotspot. In this map, as you can see, the redder the country is, the more vulnerable the country is to climate change. And unfortunately, my beloved Philippines is the reddest of them all. And it just speaks to you about the uh, high degree of vulnerability of the Philippines and of its neighboring countries uh, to climate change and its health effects. And this has been very, um, you know, palpable and, and uh, uh, concrete and, and visible uh, in the Philippines, even while fighting an unseen coronavirus. So as you can see in this picture, people uh, during the course of COVID have faced, um, you know, a, a very huge dilemma. On one hand, do I stay in the house, protect myself from COVID? while at the same time, my roof gets blown away by the strong wind or my house gets inundated by intense flooding. On the other hand, do I move to these cramped evacuation centers safe from climate-related disasters, but facing a high risk of contracting the virus? Because as you can see, there's no social distancing in these places to begin with. And so these are real challenges. The confluence of climate change and COVID experience by the least um, you know, advantage uh, in the Philippines alone. And then of course, Asia is expected to become much warmer in the coming decades, as you can easily uh, you know, see in, in these uh, maps uh, all the way until 2050. And we know that high temperatures will in, uh, jeopardize the ability of our farmlands to produce food to ensure our, you know, uh, our long-term nutrition but at the same time will expose us to extreme heat that can lead to uh, more uh, increased uh, emergency consults because of heat stroke and other rela heat related illnesses. And of course, we are also seeing some of our mega cities in Asia uh, already facing the risk of coastal flooding due to sea level rise when the ice caps do melt and the oceans do warm, we expect an increase in the sea level and all these mega cities that are heavily populated are at a high risk of being uh, inundated. And this can also lead to new forms of climate induced migration or forced displacement. And so we really need to address climate change because it's not just good for the climate, it's actually good for our health. There are myriad health co-benefits that we can reap if we do climate mitigation, if we reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, through better urban planning, uh, you know, shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy, redesigning our, our transport systems into one that is low carbon, that promotes active mobility, and also our agricultural and food systems. Uh, we need to transform into low carbon, uh, and and um, you know uh, uh, agricultural systems that also do not destroy the water, the air, and the soil, uh, and also emit less uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I discussed to you about climate change, which is one of the most pressing planetary health challenges in a region. Of course, there are many others, and you know the second one is of course the uh, the continued destruction of our biodiversity, deforestation, uh, continuous uh, urbanization, encroachment into natural ecosystems, and of course, as I've mentioned already, the agricultural system, which is uh, humanizing our natural ecosystems, our natural landscapes. All of this can. Uh, provide the breeding ground for the next zoonotic spillover. You know, when, an, when a, a virus or a pathogen jumps from an animal to a human being and which can lead to another future pandemic. And so we really need to go to the roots of these emerging infectious diseases and not just address the healthcare aspect uh, of infectious disease prevention and control. And as you can see, Asia is quite an important uh, hotspot of, of biodiversity. 
And we know that we, uh, if we protect the biodiversity of our forests and even our marine ecosystems, we can ensure that we are also protected from the risk of future uh, outbreaks that can lead to much bigger pandemics. So in this map, you can see that Southeast Asia and, the, and East Asia and even South Asia are really hot spots for infectious disease emergence. So, you know, where the biodiversity lies, the, the microbes do, um, you know, thrive in these environments. And if we disturb these uh, natural ecosystems, there's a higher risk that these um, microbes can uh, get released uh, to human populations, which can lead to another COVID-19. And as you can see in this study, the, uh, some, the ex experts have estimated that the cost of preventing the next pandemic through conservation efforts, through addressing climate change and you know, other um, you know, drivers of infectious disease emergence, if we only spend uh, on these efforts, we will actually be saving a lot of money, only 2% of the entire COVID-19 bill, which is by the way, still running and expanding, uh, is, uh, is necessary uh, in order to prevent the next pandemic. And so we hope to make sure that the investments are not only focused on the current response, but also in, um, on um, you know, putting in place mechanisms, infrastructure to prevent the next one. I've already mentioned a lot about food systems, um, you know, the food system is a source of climate change of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. It is also one major reason why we are having, uh, you know, these, this risk of uh, zoonotic spillover. But we also have to remember that the same food system is also uh, producing food that is inequitably distributed. Two billion people on earth are over consuming you know, with obesity and overweight continuously on the rise. Of course, we know that these diseases are not uh, purely due to uh, overconsumption, but there are also other reasons. But certainly the food system is a huge contributor to the obesity epidemic. Meanwhile, one billion people on earth are under consuming and they're suffering from different forms of undernutrition. So as you can see, our global food systems, even our regional food system in Asia, has so many defects, creating all these problems of climate change, zoonotic spillover, obesity, and undernutrition. And that is why uh, in 2019, there is a Lancet uh, commission that published and introduced this new concept called the planetary health diet. The type of diet, the type of plate that will safeguard not just our own health, because as you can see, it's filled with nutritious um, you know, and health rich uh, food, but also this is the plate that will safeguard the future of our planet um, because it's low carbon, it's not going to uh, destroy, you know, ecosystems, not requiring um, a lot of, uh, you, know, you know, land use change, for instance, that might, that might lead to biodiversity loss. And as you can see, the plate is filled with greens and vegetables and whole grains and a very, very minimal portion is uh, uh, dedicated to red meat because red meat, the meat industry, is also a leading greenhouse gas emitter, not to mention already declared by WHO as a carcinogen and also contributing to the no chronic non-communicable disease epidemic. And um, the last of these uh, grand challenges in planetary health that we are seeing, especially in Asia, is, is urbanization, which I already mentioned a while ago. Because at the end of the day, all these problems are highly interconnected. We cannot um, you know, continue business as usual addressing all these problems in a siloed approach because these are systems problems, systems that are intersecting with one another. And this last problem that I want to raise uh, to you is urbanization and all its uh, planetary health impacts. More than 50% of the world's megacities can be found in the Asia region alone. And so we really need to address the mo modern day challenges of urbanization that create new health problems, but also uh, lead to uh, environmental uh, degradation and destruction. 
So for instance, many of our cities in uh, Asia are also uh, highly uh, polluted, uh, you know, uh, or suffering from high levels of air pollution. We know that air pollution is a major cause of disease and death, um, you know, and, and the estimate globally is that 7 million deaths annually can be attributed to air pollution. And these are just some of the Asian numbers, numbers from some of the major Asian cities. And so we need to start thinking about how do we want um, our cities uh, to uh, evolve in the next couple of decades if we want cities that are um, you know, uh, uh, abiding by planetary health principles, improving people's health, while at the same time safeguarding the planet's health as well. So I hope that was not very overwhelming. I hope I did not paint a very bleak uh, picture of our future, uh, of, of the future of the world, but also the future of Asia. And that's why for the next several minutes, I want to close by sharing with you some initial insights on what can we do as a region? What is our role in, in this um, important mission to safeguard the health of people and planet? So I mentioned already planetary health and, and, and um, planetary health as a discipline, as a new framework, as a new paradigm requires not just a professional society, it requires a movement. And that is why I invite you all to join us in the Planetary Health Alliance, which is headquartered at Harvard University, but it already has more than 300 member organizations from around the world. Our most recent conference uh, in April this year was attended by nearly 5,000 people from around the world. Perhaps that is one of the silver linings of uh, the Zoomification resulting from COVID. Uh, we were able to make our conference much more accessible to many people around the world. And as I've mentioned already, many organizations, many educational institutions have already been um, establishing planetary health programs, courses, centers. But as you can see in this, uh, you know, uh, sampling of, of logos of institutions, most of them are actually located in the global north, in North America and in Europe. And so there is really an opportunity for Asia to find its place in this evolving planetary health, um, you know, space, community. And I invite all the listeners uh, from Singapore and beyond to start thinking, what can we do? What can our instit institutions do and establish and build so that we can contribute Asian ideas and solutions to these uh, planetary health challenges? So one of our efforts is really to come up with, you know, Asian approaches, Asian uh, frameworks and solutions. And, and this is just one of these of, of our attempts. Uh, we came up with this article, which was published a couple of months ago. What is the contribution of Islam to planetary health? And, and I'm pretty sure the same can be asked of every Asian religion and philosophy that exists, Buddhism, Hinduism, um, and, and all the indigenous cultures also of Asia. And so I invite our listeners to, to think about what can we contribute to planetary health using an Asian uh, perspective. We need to start educating our new generation of planetary health citizens. And this is a framework from the Planetary Health Alliance. I'm not going to detail. You can easily Google this framework. But what is important is that we should start talking about how we can embed planetary health principles into the education, not just of undergraduates and, and, and graduate students, but also uh, for K-12 students, pre-university students, we need to start planetary health education while uh, our, um, you know, our, our people are still young you know, and, and they are moldable and they can um, um, internalize planetary health principles. So it's really not just knowledge, but habits and mindsets that are being inculcated. So this is just one example. Uh, the University of the Philippines uh, in Los Baños, Laguna, is the first university in the Philippines to actually offer a course 
uh, that uh, adopts or embraces planetary health principles. And I would love to hear if there are other uh, universities and institutions across Asia that have already started designing curricula uh, for planetary health for their students. We also need to ensure that our regional uh, governance structures embrace planetary health. And for those who are very much involved in the discussions around um, you know, ASEAN, you know, uh, improving ASEAN regional health governance to address this current epidemic and to make sure that this is the last epidemic of this kind. Uh, it will be great to um, engage in conversations. How can we make sure that the future ASEAN Center for Public Health Emergencies and emerging diseases that is currently being deliberated by the 10 ASEAN member countries, how can we make sure this center has a very strong planetary health uh, focus? Uh, by the way, this new center that is, uh, uh, you know, that is hoped to be established very soon is the ASEAN counterpart of, you know, the CDC. We have to find planetary health solutions, and there are some planetary health solutions already happening in our region. For instance, this uh, NGO called Health in Harmony and, and ASTRI, which is an NGO in Indonesia, have pioneered the application of planetary health to improving the health of people in Borneo, but at the same time, uh, ensuring the uh, preservation of the forests uh, there in, in the island. And, and I invite you to look at this study. They were able to show that during a time, uh, that at, uh, during a period of, uh, uh, or during a 10 year period, uh, they were able to conserve uh, a huge, uh, significant um, uh, amount of forest that is, by the way, an important carbon sink. They absorb, they are uh, carbon, they sequester carbon. They were able to preserve a, a huge chunk of the forest while providing integrated health solutions. So now healthcare is not anymore just improving people's health, but also the forest's health as well. And then another example, another amazing Asian example is uh, with the Dalin Chuchi Hospital in, in Taiwan where they are not anymore purchasing food from outside uh, the hospital. You know, they are growing food inside their very own backyard. They're serving plant-based diets to both patients and staff alike. And so the entire hospital has already avoided the, um, you know, the high carbon emissions coming from large scale agriculture and long distance transport. Hopefully, all our hospitals in Asia can emulate from this example. And so we need more social innovations for planetary health. And I actually invite you, we have a conversation happening on October 6. These are the details. And you can also uh, Google this event. Uh, join us because we're going to have a conversation about what is the potential of social innovation to address the myriad planetary health challenges that I just described to you a while ago. We need our health systems to be planetary health oriented in this century. And when you say a health system is planetary health oriented, it doesn't only mean that it's universal, accessible to all, but also it should be high value. People leave the healthcare system, the hospital and the clinic, not just healthier, but also happier. But also our, our planetary health oriented health systems should be climate smart. And climate smart is a term that brings together um, climate adaptation, meaning health systems should be able to respond to the health challenges that climate change uh, is bringing, but also climate mitigation is part of climate smart, meaning our health systems are uh, low carbon, abiding by green sustainable practices um, and, and principles and not contributing to the climate crisis. As, I have sh as I've shown to you a while ago, uh, using the uh, Chuchi Hospital's example. And of course, we need to make sure that our health systems are pandemic resistant, especially now that we have COVID uh, teaching us many lessons. And so, you know, Climate Smart, as I've said, combines the idea of a climate resilient health systems. We want health systems that bend but do not break. We want our hospitals and health facilities 
that are the last building or the last system standing when climate related disasters do strike i'll not i'll not go into detail but you can google this operational framework from the world health organization where they tried to embed climate resilient principles into the different uh, six building blocks of the health system. So for those who are working in the area of health systems, you should be familiar with the six building blocks framework. And then of course, I've already reiterated a while ago, we need to decarbonize as well our health sector. This is a report that I had the privilege to co-author. We publish it uh, early this year. And as you can see, just by focusing on seven high impact actions alone, shifting to renewable energy, green building design, sustainable transport for patients and staff, low carbon pharmaceuticals, sustainable healthcare waste management, um, low carbon and sustainable and healthy food, all these actions can lead to significant reductions of greenhouse gas gases um, emissions coming from the health sector alone. That will be a great contribution of our sector to climate protection. And we actually also are bringing, um, you know, planetary health and, and climate uh, action uh, to the level of, of clinicians, of individual clinicians and practitioners. And I invite you to Google this, uh, uh, you know, commentary that we co-wrote. Uh, we, what we did is we actually uh, revised or said, uh, proposed a revision of the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, the doctors and the health professionals in the room uh, should be familiar with that uh, oath or pledge that we recite before we enter practice. So we, we uh, uh, propose a revision to embed planetary health principles. Basically, what we're saying is that we health professionals in the Anthropocene should um, embrace this idea that we're not just taking care of a uh, you know, human patient alone, but also of the planetary patient as well. We are building now our Southeast Asian Planetary Health Alliance. So if you are interested, please reach out to us and let's uh, uh, explore how we can collaborate and build the community in the region. And we also established a national community in the Philippines, Planetary Health Philippines. And it's uh, an interdisciplinary, intersectoral, intergenerational, and international community because we also invited Filipino scholars and practitioners who are part of the Philippine dias Filipino diaspora to be part of this young, vibrant, growing community of uh, scholars, practitioners, and advocates all united for healthy people and healthy planet. And of course, we need to bring planetary health to the communities. It can't be just an academic exercise or a policy discussion. We need to bring the message of planetary health to the front lines. And we also need to find the solutions from the frontline communities because they are the ones who are already seeing these initial effects of climate change unfolding in front of their very eyes. For instance, in these coastal areas in the Philippines. We just started the first planetary and global health program here in the Philippines at the St. Luke's Medical Center, uh, the leading academic medical center of the country. And so we hope to explore co more collaborations on planetary health research, um, education and practice uh, through St. Luke's uh, in the coming uh, years. And right now, this is just a sampling of the projects that we've already started uh, you know, during the past year, ranging from building climate resilient health systems, the impact of climate change on mental health, the future of wet markets. How can we make sure that the next pandemic does not erupt from one of the wet markets of Southeast Asia? How can we make sure that wildlife trade uh, is not contributing to the zo to zoonotic spillovers? And this is my most important update. So beginning, um, well, it's actually had, had begun already. Uh, I'm wearing a second hat, and this is my more international hat. So you might be familiar with Sunway University and the Sunway Group uh, in Malaysia. So we have just established a new Sunway Center for Planetary Health based in Kuala Lumpur. And we want to turn this center into a leading a hub of scholarship, education, policy solutions on planetary health. We have a focus on Asia and the Pacific, uh, and it will be headed, it is headed with uh, by our executive director, Tan Sri, Dr. Jamila Mahmood, 
uh, who might be familiar to some of you. She used to be the Under Secretary General of the Red Cross worldwide, and she just finished her uh, role as a special advisor to the Malaysian Prime Minister on Public Health. So she actually is now our founding executive director, and I am uh, the founding chief planetary health scientist of this center. So we hope to collaborate with all of you uh, in the coming uh, months and years. Uh, if you are from Malaysia, please reach out. We will be happy to explore how we can work together. Because Sunway University made a commitment to be the first planetary health-oriented university in the world. One of our tasks is to revamp the undergraduate curriculum. We are designing a core course that will be taken by all students, regardless of faculty. You can be an accounting student, an engineering student, a veterinary student, a culinary arts student, a nursing student, but all of you will be taking the same course on planetary health to prepare the next generation of planetary health leaders in Malaysia, in Southeast Asia, and in the world. So to wrap up my presentation, and I know that's quite a lot, uh, I tried to really squeeze in as much information as I can. This is a, re, uh, a very comprehensive survey of planetary health, the problems, and what the solutions are, you know, I'm sure you're very familiar with this um, with this diagram. We need to flatten the curve of COVID-19. But this is not the only curve that we should be flattening. We should also flatten our ecological curve, our carbon footprint, our sustainability footprint. And we need to make sure we, we bend this fast because the Earth's capacity is limited and it's uh, constant, it's unchangeable, it's non-negotiable. We cannot lift that Earth's capacity horizontal, horizontal line up. You can't add more beds. You can't purchase more vaccines. It's constant. So the only curve that can be flattened is our ecological curve. And we have a perfect opportunity here. Everyone is now talk, talking about the post-COVID future. How can we use the recovery process uh, towards building a green, healthy, and just society? Um, so this is a grand opportunity for planetary health. How can we use the recovery processes at national and international levels uh, as, as a channel to build that greener, healthier, and more just planetary health future? I think we should interrogate and expand our vision for the new normal because the old was not normal. And that requires not just you know, Band-Aid solutions, it requires a total renovation of the political economy of planetary health. We need to shift our mindset from the old classical economic thinking. We can consume limits, limitlessly, produce uh, endlessly, and instead shift towards a more donut economy model, an economy, a society that protects the health of the planet while meeting the needs uh, the health needs of its people. I think planetary health has a very powerful uh, and strong decolonizing power because it's not just the colonial nature of our activities now, you know, the Western centric notions and policies and knowledge systems, but even us as humanity has colonized nature and has also colonized the future, the ability of our future children to survive and thrive. And I think that you know, this decolonizing power requires a shift from an ecological approach that we are at the top of the pyramid of nature. We can consume, extract, mine, and pollute, and instead shift towards a truly ecological approach in harmony with nature, with all creatures great and small, and thriving you know, in, with, in, in, in interdependence with the Earth's life-supporting systems. And finally, I think planetary health is a call for us to become good ancestors. This is another amazing uh, new book. And basically what planetary health is telling us is that in 2121, a hundred years from now, what we want is the children of that generation will read the history books, we look back to the past, and they will say that the COVID generation of 2021, which is us, have been good ancestors to them because we've made the right decisions, not just for our own health and well-being, but for their survival as well. Because we owe it to our children, we owe it to their children, and for the future children of Asia and the world who are yet to come.
So together, let's advance the health of people and planet. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Great. Thanks so much, Renzo. That was an amazing breadth of information and context that you provided. And actually, this last bit, though, I think is really maybe, you know, without getting to specific uh, topics is a mindset change that we need to do. So it's really, it's not, all, oh, we need to change this on this issue and we need to change this. We really need to think differently. And I think you brought that out very much. We need, all need to be decolonized, you know, in ourselves. It's not just a North versus South issue. It's like, like you mentioned, we are colonizing the world in all kinds of ways. So that mindset is a huge, you know, issue to consider. I do have a few questions, but in the meantime, I'll ask the audience to post any questions they have in the chat box. And I'll start with addressing the one question we got uh, uh, with someone registered, when they asked, what is the most pressing uh, issue in planetary health in Asia? So you covered a lot of them, but maybe if you could point one or two, you know, as this is something we need to maybe start off immediately with, and then obviously incorporate that whole mindset change. Right. I, well, I think the quick answer is we, we need to really have a, a strong, um, you know, uh, response to, to climate change. Uh, that one has a deadline, 2030, which is nine years from now. The Paris Agreement, uh, which all ASEAN countries have, have agreed to uh, and, and approved and, and signed and ratified, um, requires us to make sure we do not uh, cross the planetary boundary of climate change. Remember that planetary boundaries framework. So we're getting near there. You know, uh, and, and we need huge uh, and even dramatic and accelerated decarbonization efforts. Of course, you might say, oh, you know, not all Asian countries are emitting that, you know, uh, as much as, let's say, you know, the U.S. or the Western countries or, or even China. By the way, China now is, the, is a way bigger emitter than the U.S., uh, it has, um, you know, reached that that uh, uh, level uh, over the past uh, years alone, uh, and, and so we need to come together and have a very strong stand that we will decarbonize from within, and we will also call the rest of the world to, you know, make their share, to to give their share. Uh, so, so I think climate change is is the most, I guess, pressing, most immediate. But I think ultimately, and this is somehow related to what you, uh, you Amina said, you know, it's, it's mindset change, it's paradigm change that is truly what's needed, right? And, and hopefully with that paradigm shift, uh, the, economic will sh the economic model will shift, and then the political systems and the, the social systems will shift, and then eventually uh, our planet will be much safer and our people will be much healthier. That's quite a long pathway you know, uh, to go, but we, we need to start somewhere. And, and picking up on that point and maybe uh, pushing you a little bit more, even more than what you already presented. So, you know, you presented uh, kind of uh, what's happening in many different fields, food systems, you know, the need to be better prepared for pandemics and, you know, kind of a range of things. But often, especially, uh, again, in response to when people have been kind of... Uh, breaking down the current pandemic we and trying to trace back to you know uh, uh, reasons and all they sometimes stop at oh this needs this happened because of you know the way we were interacting with the uh, um, human uh, and the animal interaction or this happened because of our surveillance system and all but what, maybe you can reflect a bit more of a, even a bigger framework of at the root of it is uh, the way I see it, and a lot of people, you know, have written about is consumption patterns. You know, so we can do, you know, this in this area and that is done. But unless we really have a change of, you know, not a lifestyle change which is uh, at the edges, but really a way of consuming in every way what we are eating, how we are living, what we are buying. You know, it feeds into the whole economic model. There's always a push to buy more, consume more. That makes you advance, you know. But, you know, it also, when you presented the data on Vietnam, I was curious to know if one of the reasons uh, of Vietnam was, you know, maybe they have, at least so far, although they might be moving in the wrong direction, uh, you know, uh, like a lifestyle or a pattern or an economic system that is not so pushy on consumption. Right. And and you know what? Um, thanks for reminding me about consumption. And, and maybe that's actually, you know, one of the uh, my answers to your earlier question about what's the pressing challenge or, or maybe what's the root cause 
of, of all these challenges. And, and yes, it's consumption patterns, but we also have to remember that is this, are these consumption patterns really just part of human behavior or is it uh, fueled by something else? You know, And oftentimes we forget about the industry side of things that maybe some of the demand that we all, you know, corporates will always say, oh, there's a demand. But is that a true demand or is that a supplier driven demand? You know, is that a fabricated demand? You know, and, you know, when you go to, you know, other places, um, you know, maybe even in Asian context or maybe even within our own countries, you know, people are quite, um, you know, satisfied with, let's say, sustainable living, right? And it's only when we start introducing, I don't know whether you call them modern or Western lifestyles, that's when, you know, you create such a demand and then now industry will quote unquote respond by creating new products, et cetera. And then that cycle just keeps on uh, continuing. And so, yes, we need to start looking at consumption, but we need to make sure we're not putting the onus on individual people alone. You know, we're not blaming them for consuming, you know, gadgets and different kinds of food when in fact, the corporates, the industry has a role to play and government has a role to play to set boundaries, right? To put in place regulations, et cetera. And so at the end of the day, it's really a multi-sectoral approach that is needed uh, to uh, you know, uh, change the consumption patterns of the world um, and, and make them um, con- uh, and, and focus on consumption that are really helpful to human life and human existence while at the same time, not impinging on planetary boundaries. So we're not saying we have to stop consuming. We have to, it's, it's just finding that sweet spot where our consumption patterns are good for people and planet. Going to your other question about Vietnam and, and the donut economy, you know what? My original plan in 2020 was to organize a fact-finding mission to go to Vietnam, you know, a group of diff, you know, people from different disciplines to actually answer that question. Why, according to this study, uh, Vietnam is closest to becoming a donut? Of course, we have to have, and that's why I gave a caveat a while ago, behind these numbers are stories. And, you know, we're not saying we all need to follow the social and political configuration of Vietnam. You know, some might, you know, resonate with it. Some might think, oh, you know, that that's not the model that we want. Uh, But what I'm interested in is what are these lessons from the Vietnamese experience and all the other countries that are close to becoming a donut that we can that we can follow, that we can uh, copy. Um, And and uh, uh, I think some of the lessons are, you know, maybe uh, or, or, um, you know, secrets of Vietnam are around, you know, their their, you know, maybe and then maybe the culture has something to uh, to contribute to it as well, you know the the kind of lifestyle that they have, uh, the kind of consumption behaviors that that they have. They surely have policies that you know protect uh, you know uh, the environment uh, very strongly. Uh, but also their healthcare system um, is is quite uh, you know community oriented and and with a very strong emphasis on primary care. Maybe that's part of the secret and. You know, their COVID experience is also telling about their health system. And so I'm sure there are so many other lessons we can learn. Uh, and of course, the challenge for places like Singapore and the United States is how can you retain that high level of human development while at the same time reverse the, in, the violation of the planetary boundaries that unfortunately your societies and your economies have afflicted on Mother Earth? Big challenge, of course. (laughs) Yes, of course. And maybe that goes to the point you, I think, made kind of repeatedly of the need for action and collaboration at the multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder level. I particularly liked your, you know, the emphasis on community involvement in the Philippines that you talked about. So maybe you can expand, you know, on maybe different models of doing that or, you know, potential models if they haven't already been in place. Right. And, and, you know, that's part of our, um, I guess, also decolonizing planetary health or democratizing planetary health. We don't want this to be another discipline for the academics, right? We want this to be a transformational, you know, you, may, you might call it movement. You might want to call it paradigm. Uh, and, and, but it's also a discipline. It's a field. Um, 
and and to make sure that happens uh um that that it's democratic and decolonized we need to to make sure that that people and everyday people farmers and fisher folk indigenous populations um people who are affected already by disasters that they are meaningfully engaged not in a token way uh, and so you know we're starting some we've started some projects that really engage with young people uh with all these different constituencies um and and as i mentioned a while ago we have also have this starting and growing interest in the role of social innovation because we academics can create the models and write these elegant papers and prescribe the solutions but the social innovators who are and the social entrepreneurs who are the ones trying to fix the many problems of the world perhaps do have uh, some of the answers and the solutions to these pressing and seemingly insurmountable planetary health problems. The beauty of planetary health is that it, it's really an invitation for us to work together. We are at a very young you know, and early phase in the development of the planetary health story of the world and of, and, and of Asia. And so there's room for everybody. And so if planetary health spoke to your heart through this session, uh, please join us and we'll be happy to work together and collaborate. Yeah, and we are happy to we'll circulate that around to at least all the audience uh, for today. Um, so I'm looking at the time, and as usual, we can talk endlessly. <laughs> uh, there's always something more to say, but um, I'll have to call to a close. I do have one question from the audience, so maybe we can finish on that because I don't want to, you know, not address it. It's um, how can we ensure that countries are acting in the best interest of planetary health when many initiatives are voluntary, non-enforceable, and kind of success stories in isolation? Right. Very important question and a difficult one because, she, sure, we have a, a, a vision for planetary health, and then here comes reality, right? When, when countries are, you know, especially with COVID, right? We just saw that countries pay lip service to solidarity and equity and collaboration you know it's it's all about you know what what is um uh good for their own citizens first and foremost and, and that's quite a challenge to the planetary health message which is basically we're all interconnected we need to address these shared challenges but we also need to you know do our part right we can't be expecting planetary health transformation and still continuing our old dirty uh, high carbon, pollutive lifestyles and, and economies. And so it's really a challenge. And I think the first step is through dialogue at all levels. Uh, and we're working hard to make sure that planetary health penetrates, um, you know, high level international dialogues, for instance, or even at the national level. Uh, for instance, Malaysia uh, is, is now considering uh, to to establish some planetary health roadmap or policy. And it will be great if we can adopt that, uh, if we can have something ASEAN-wide, for instance, right? Uh, an ASEAN planetary health dialogue policy mechanism, whatever. So I think the dialogue needs to happen first and, a, and it should be meaningful, uh, action-oriented, inclusive, uh, and also you know, partici the participants of the dialogue should really be open uh, to change and to new opportunities. I'll stop there. Well, thanks a lot. You've left uh, you know a lot on the table and a lot of action points for people to pick up on. So I hope we can continue it just not just at a conversational level, but as you're saying in a practical level. But with that, I'll kind of close the webinar. Thank you very much, Renzo. That was great. Thank you. Always. And thank you to the audience. Um, hope you kind of uh, you know enjoy that, learn from it. We'll get involved and. Um, uh, look out for our next one, but really, this was great to hear, get this perspective. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the uh, SDGHI organizers, as usual. Uh, they are, you know, um, at the top of their game, and uh, it was great to have you all in the audience.